So Dustin and I were having an email exchange about typicality and probability because I was trying to figure out what you think about the idea of um, engaging in typicality rather than probability. <coughs> or characteristic statistical mechanics. And it emerged that speculative was supporting that this issue is connected with a whole bunch of other issues that I was interested in. Nature probability of general laws, measure um, of laws, relationships and probability and uh, belief and so on. So I thought it gives rise to a whole bunch of issues that we could have fun discussing. And I think that there is probably some fun in discussing it since I noticed that for a couple of lunches these issues were hotly debated by people at lunch. Um, <coughs> So, in, in the fear of getting too, I hope it doesn't get too hot. It's hot enough. We have powerful air conditioners. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, so we started in the wrong place. Today. Statistical mechanics concerns the probabilistic behavior of thermodynamic systems. 
on typicality of towns, but we know more details a little bit later. The basic idea is that typical behavior is behavior that mostly occurs. In the finite case, everybody understands what that means. In, in, <coughs> in, you need to give it a characterization of what you mean by mostly. It's not just the counting, the cardinality, which mostly. The connection between uh, typical, typical behavior and epistemology is uh, in something that's gotten to be called Cardo's principle, made popular especially by my colleague Ben Schaefer. Um, and some principle like this is suggested by Cardo. Um, everybody knows he's not Cardo. Right? I was confused when I first heard that. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's stated by Bruno Lee and other people. It also goes along whether, well with non-humanism with respect to laws. In fact, I think one of the motivations, or some people's motivations for optimal typicality rather than probability is, a, a, is that they think of laws in a non-human way. Um, and the idea that non-trivial probabilities are connected with indeterministic dynamical laws well, deterministic probabilities, to the extent that, that one wants to talk about them on the typicality side, uh, given the frequency. Okay, can I ask you about that? Uh, Why are indeterministic laws with non trivial probabilities in them lumped in with the typicality approach? It doesn't seem to me that if, what, if you have that, you have to invoke any kind of. No, I don't think, I don't think a number of these things are not necessarily connected. It's, it's um, you know, when you build up your fortifications, you grab whatever it is that's nearby that you think will. I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried that I, mean, I hate it when cable packages bundle, 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 bundle things and say, well, if you want all these things that you like, you also have to look at these channels okay. you don't like. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that, that's not where I'm going. Okay. Yeah. Barry, can I, can I just have the, the first equation you have there under two typical behavior is behavior in most cities. I don't know of anybody defending so Shall we do that? that? Those, I think I would put my words. It's, it's, that's not what he believes. I, I think that's true. So just so what what typical said. behavior is? Typical behavior is behavior which, uh, according to a typicality <coughs> measure on the, on the space of initial states, overwhelming. So I don't know what's the large, is a large set which would give rise to that behavior. So it's nothing about what actually happens. Not by analytical. It doesn't say it's, but okay, so, so the use I had in mind is something like this. Typically, uh, July days in bar are sunny. And that's how I understand typicality. And then yeah, typicality, okay. So maybe that'll make a difference how it's discussion with those. Okay. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, I, the application of typicality in statistical mechanics, I understood as a generalization of that use. Yeah, that's so, so, so this is incorrect. This is just okay. incorrect. Okay. So there's okay. going to be a miscommunication. And Cournot's principle, um, the connection between uh, what's typical and what you believe is that uh, typical um, <coughs> believe uh, that, the, what's, that if something is typical, or you think it's typical, believe that it occurs. Um, it also goes on with non humanism with respect to laws. I'm giving myself a little bit here. Um, the, the, and I think that some people who have typicality accounts don't want to talk about probability at all, and some do, but to the extent that they do, they want to think about probability in a frequency way by the law of large numbers, something like uh, <coughs> that uh, the probability of a coin that it has a half because it's typical that long sequences of uh, clips of that coin. Um, uh, out of frequency of about half. And I'm understanding this in terms of what actually happens, so I think this will make a big difference. Yeah, this is just not what people are so, Okay. Um, well, I guess I agree that this putting these together into two packages is really making me nervous. As you mentioned yesterday, the, um, I hate good who is upset about people talking about Bayesianism as if it were one thing, wrote a letter to um, Journal of American Statistics Society, had 46,656 subscribers, Bayesianism. 
pretty much everything on this slide is logically <laughs> independent of, 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 of things. So on almost all of these things, you could take a view, and there's probably something like you know several thousand views actually. So I, I agree with that. Okay. Okay. But part of the reason I'm, I mean I have a particular understanding of some particular philosophers in mind, and um, I think one of the motivations for replacing uh, probability talk, totality talk, is um, a non-union view about the laws of probability. So that's how I think it goes together. Not that they are necessarily connected with each other. But yeah, sure, you can think of this as a, a menu. You, you, know, it's a, you might have to order uh, the main dish, which is maybe to the calorie or probability. You get to choose your desserts and your drinks. Okay. Um, so, so if you think of typicality in this counting way, as I was suggesting that Tim was and I a little bit more about, I guess, um, uh, then uh, when it comes to uh, infinite sets, or countable sets, or sets of uh, initial conditions, um, you, you need to have some way of keeping track of uh, replacing counting, and that's so by typicality measure. And the way I understand it is that people who like the typicality approach think that there's some special connection of some sort between the dynamical laws and, and this measure. Um, and that I've heard different suggestions about what this suggestion is, but it's usually thought of in some way as being a limit or a necessary connection and being a priori in the sense that you look at the dynamical laws you can figure out what the right typicality measure is. So on. In any case, the view of this view is that statistical mechanics concern the typical behavior of the system. Okay, so probability is a familiar notion that's been developed, in, uh, especially in the 20th century, in a uh, way it's been axiomatized. Um, the only attempt to axiomatize <coughs> typicality that I know of, or maybe other things, is actually by a student of mine. Uh, not that it's such a big deal, but one may wonder about typicality, um, whether, for example, in an axiom like this case, if A is typical and B is typical, is A and B typical? Um, anyway, probability is axiomatized by Paul Laura and others. It's objective, when we think about it here. It's compatible with deterministic laws on the kind of account of probability we want to fit in simplicity and mechanics. It's an awful probability that's connected with the laws, but not entailed by the dynamical laws. And it's connected to credences by what was called the principal principle, or something very close to that. Um, and by the principal principle, I mean principles like this, Lewis formulates it like as the following, that your credence in A, um, given that the objective probability of A is X, and anything else E, as long as E is something that's admissible, is itself as. There's a lot of discussion about how, whether or not you need this admissibility clause, what it's doing there, and so on. I think you can get rid of it completely. The one way to do it is where I was suggesting another formulation of a, 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 a credence uh, objective probability connection is that the credence in A, given that the objective probability B, given A is X, and B is itself should be X. Um, can I give me a Make a quick comment. So you've got the principal principle up, up here, and this, this is good. Earlier you glossed it as um, your degree of belief, given that you know that the, that the probability is x, should be, should be x. And I think there's a big difference, an important difference between that gloss and what is actually written. Because well, there are two principles here. Either one. Either, either one, because that doesn't say given that you know that it's the case. It's not saying that, no. Right. It, it says conditional on the supposition right. that it is. And I think that's important because, in my view, where the principal principle really does work is in conditions where you don't know what the, what the objective probability so, is and you're trying to find out. So I don't think that, that yes, it does work there, but in, for a major, it does work because of the way it yeah. right, fits in the base theorem. But um, the. Uh, or oh, maybe it's important that, 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 that it's this rather than we Okay, it so I think the word no is just a, a gloss on this objection, but in yeah. my point of view, it sounds like you think it's important. 
It's important not to. But there are these two forms. One I think of as an okay. internal form of the principal principle, which is the first one, it's mm -hmm. under my name, and then a sort of external form. But the idea is that um, that objective probabilities are in some mm -hmm. way the world's expert degrees of belief. So the world's probabilities. And you're trying to track them in your own credences. That's the big picture in any way. Whether you think this picture is remotely um, realistic or not is a question to be discussed. Yeah. Um, and by credences, I mean degrees of belief. And there's, um, there are arguments that degrees of belief ought to, if they're rational, conform to the axioms of probability. So here we're talking not about objective physical probabilities, but about epistemic probabilities. Um, and the belief state is represented <coughs> by a, a, a subjective uh, probability distribution, or a set of, 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 uh, of probabilities, uh, subjective probability distributions. Even the set of, of all of them, which would correspond to David's famous, I don't have a clue. Um, okay, and there are arguments that um, if you want to be rational and have degrees of belief, they ought to conform to the axioms of probability. It's famous Dutch book arguments and their accuracy arguments from um, Joyce and Pettigrew and others. Um, and that they're connected with decision uh, via maximizing expected utility and so on. I'm just saying this to remind people about it because I'm sure that everybody knows about this stuff. Um, the crucial thing is that there is a rational way to change degrees of belief um, uh, when presented with something you take as evidence. That's by conditionalization or by Jeffrey conditionalization. Um, these are special cases of a kind of maximum entropy rule, which says uh, when, when you require new evidence or something you take to the evidence, change your degrees of belief, take that out of work while making the least change and everything else is possible. So these changes measured in terms of the um, this extended temperature there. Okay. And there are further, maybe further requirements on rationality of degrees of belief, like the principle of principle. Um, but the main thing I'm interested in here is the idea that um, the, what credences are doing is they're aiming to match the objective uh, probabilities. Okay, so is an account of laws and other nomological modalities. Um, the way I view it is that there are these two big traditions in how to think about laws, and they, this carries over to how to think about objective probabilities and, and causation and counterfactuals too, although as Wayne was saying, you can adjust these connections in various ways. Um, uh, one tradition takes the view that what laws do is that they govern the evolution of events. Um, this was the way laws were introduced when the notion became popular in the sciences in the 17th century. The idea of the goal of physics was to discover the laws which govern the evolution of events. And the other is a somewhat deflated notion when people got worried that they didn't understand what governing the evolution of events meant. This something motivated that way. Um, and they think of laws as certain kinds of descriptions of the events that occur throughout the whole history of the universe. Okay. And the, the person who developed that kind of view most was a philosopher, David Lewis, who developed a kind of view that he calls humanism, which is, has a couple of components. One is that there's no fundamental necessary connections between fundamental properties of quantity and instantiations, and that all truths, including what's true about the laws, what the laws obtain, truths about probabilities, there are truths about counterfactuals, causation, and so on, supervene the totality of fundamental property instantiation. That means that once the, um, the whole history of the universe is in place, from the beginning, or at least a big chunk of it, a big block of it is in place, um, the, the, uh, that determines what counterfactuals are true or false, what laws obtained. Um, and so on. So on this view, it's the fact <coughs> that makes the laws obtain. There's another sense in which, of course, we think of the laws as making facts obtain, but I think these are two different senses of 
making. Maybe we want to talk about that after a while. Um, okay, so how probability enters this account. Well, let me say a little bit more about Lewis's account. So Lewis thinks of laws as being certain um, uh, generalizations or equations um, that <coughs> follow from the best system in systematization of the whole history of fundamental property instantiations throughout all of space and time. Um, he calls these, this whole history is on the Union Mosaic. Okay, it's easy to keep in mind. Um, and uh, uh, the idea is that there's a there's ways of encapsulating it, or giving information about it, and that what uh, fundamental physics is after, in some way, is giving lots of information, maybe of a special kind, about the union mosaic, and giving information in a way that's especially simple and satisfies other criteria that have evolved over the history of physics for what counts as a good or scientifically optimal uh, systematization. So the basic idea is that laws enter via the idea of systematizing the, the facts. Quite different from the idea of laws entering as something over and above the union mosaic, which govern and make things happen in the union mosaic. Um, okay. Understood this way, you can think of probability in this account as being introduced <coughs> as a way of abetting the systematization. So probability enters because it can be used this in a simple way, give a lot of information about um, events, a, a way to make this sort of vivid is think of long sequences of heads or tails, and you know, heads, heads, tails, 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 heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, and so on. And if you want to give a lot of information about it, well, giving the whole sequence would be very, very complicated. There may be no single rule which describes it all. Um, but saying that the sequence is a Bernoulli sequence with a probability of, let's say, a half, um, uh, gives a lot of information about the sequence in a fairly simple form. So that's a way within this <coughs> big picture of understanding what the probability is. <coughs> Okay, so here's a kind of proposal, um, which the way I understand it, it was sort of out there sitting for somebody to give it a name for a long time, but um, was formulated in a pretty clear way by David and his book, Time and Chance, although you can find these ingredients you know, in the Boltzmann for that matter, um, uh, which is a kind of systematization of the, the, um, the, the, the universe, of the union mosaic of our universe. The systemization consists of the fundamental dynamical laws. Now, I'm not specifying what they are because we don't know what they are correctly right now. The reasons that we discuss here think about the connection to quantum mechanics and general relativity. Um, but the idea is that there will, uh, <coughs> there is such a uh, set of dynamical laws. Um, uh, and the ingredients that are added are the claim that the universe appears its boundaries as a very, very low entropy and is otherwise what David calls cosmologically sensible, and also a statistical hypothesis that says it's uniform probability distribution over the, um, the possible microstates um, at the time of the uh, the past hypothesis over that are compatible with the past hypothesis. So you know, what does the uniform probability distribution mean here? So it, it, yeah, this, so there's a question of actually how to specify it. So it's a little vague measure. But um right. you know, as, as we were said many times, you can't take a state space and just say the vague measure. The vague measure is the vague right. measure with uh, over R to the end and can be Give me, give me, say, classical phase spaces. Lots of the local measure. measure. 
Oh, oh, so if you say little measure, that assumes I've got a classical space, phase space. Yeah. But I have no idea what the fundamental theory is or what kind of state space uh, I have. So but I'm pretty damn yeah, sure it's not going to be classical. So, so it's okay. think of it as a promise, as a promissory note. Okay. But, but part of what is being promised is that once you get to a classical description, it'll be meaningful. Well, and we went through yesterday, for example, you know, a, a, a quantum mechanical example of how to generalize uh, that idea of what the corresponding measure would be in a quantum mechanical case. So and it's the promissory note. There's going to be some state space, and when, when we have it, you're going to tell me what this measure is. Right. Right. And it will be something along the lines of the, the, the way we think about it. Right. And it will have to converge with the way classical mechanics. Uh, in, uh, uh, when we can describe the world classically mechanical on the basis of what's fundamental. Uh -huh. Well, what's, what's hiding in the phrase cosmologically sensible, roughly? <clears throat> um, so David is hiding in that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Gestures to both of 
It's not the gay guy that I can see how they And um, and without, with or without gestures, can you just tell us whether she would prove this? What? With or without gestures, can you just tell us whether she would prove this? Or yeah, it's, a proof. It's, it's that you start looking at this long enough, you can work out some situations in which it looks right that the, 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 the Louisville measure will give rise to increasing entropy in certain situations, will give rise to Brownian in motion in such and such situations. And you think, yeah, this looks like it's working. Why shouldn't it be? What's the matter with it? Okay. Um, it's, it's, putting the, it's putting the burden on the boys. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, an, an interesting feature about this, which maybe I should mention first, is what I have down to five, is that if you get in the mood to take this seriously, you realize that this um, entails a objective probability measure over a good objective conditional probability measure over all uh, pairs of, of physically specifiable propositions. And if it does that, it looks like it also do the work of entailing whatever lawful relations we think of as special science uh, uh, laws. And an interesting other feature about it is that um, those things we think of as temporal arrows um, the you know, symmetries of knowledge, the symmetries of influence of the influence of the future, but not too much about the past, and uh, to know much more about the past than about the future, and so it can be, recap can be captured by this probability um, uh, distribution. The idea being that small changes in what you can think of the media control Changes that's to say a lot of times and it's not a terrible connection and uh, small changes in uh, minds, but not in the other terrible direction. And I think this is, has some interesting philosophical consequences that um, we want to hear, but I think it provides a way of combating some of the arguments that prove that determinism are incompatible. Okay, so given this probability distribution, you, 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 it, you milk it for all it's worth. And the claim is that among the things it's worth it is recovering the special science laws, recovering the temporal arrows, um, and maybe even recovering this sort of idea that usually sh by philosophers shunted over to, to metaphysics, and maybe over to some to fundamental physics and some people. The idea that time itself is doing something like um, passing uh, that time itself has an intrinsic uh, direction. Here the directionality comes from the distribution of uh, uh, matter in space and time, matter and energy in space and time, comes from the union mosaic. So it's the directionality of time that we feel, the things we associate with the directionality of time really come from the distribution of the, uh, the structure of the union mosaic. Okay, so I also think, and this is what I've worked a bit on, is that these probabilistic correlations are ones that underlie counterfactuals and underlie causation, insofar as these can correlation, causation can be understood in terms of probabilities, which I think would go a way of doing that. Okay, so here's this big, big philosophical pictures. I mean, philosophers, if they can, can do two things. They can create these big, gigantic pictures, and then they can spend time knocking down other people's big, gigantic pictures. And we do both those things. <laughs> this is a big picture. OK, so this spectacular conception and ground of statistical mechanics and, and special science laws fits together very well with humanism. So this is another sort of package thing. They're not necessarily connected with each other. Um, so the metaculus doesn't require the mean account of laws of probability and times arrows and so on, nor the other way around, but they fit well with each other. Since the Umean account allows for there being non-trivial probabilities when the dynamics are deterministic. In fact, I should have stopped and said something about this earlier. Lewis, when he 
gave his account, the first proposal's account of you mean probability, thought that the only kinds of real probabilities there are are dynamical ones. <coughs> Was like the chair of the collapse law. Uh, but in fact, his official account of probability had room in it for there being probabilities over the whole trajectories of, of um, the universe, so assigned probabilities to sets of trajectories of these. Okay, and so it's compatible with determinism, so the dynamic laws would be deterministic. Um, and uh, when Lewis heard about this for the first time, he said, he didn't believe it. And then we heard about it the second time. He said, I see what you mean. And uh, then he died. <laughs> That's, this is true, sadly, for me. Um, OK. OK. And um, I think the other connection goes in the other way also, because I think that insofar as one who wants to follow out Lewis's Jungian program of showing how causation and counterfactuals and, and probability was supervening on the Union Mosaic, um, the metaculus would play an important role in showing how um, causation and uh, um, uh, kind of factors supervene um, and, and how the temporal arrows supervene on the Union Mosaic and when it became the one. Um, okay, on the non Union account, which I don't want to say that much about, because I don't, I'm not sure whether Dustin will take the bait and connect his um, what he's saying about typicality with an unnumian account, but I know he believes in an unnumian account and has reasons for it. So let me just say one or two things about it in the page later. So in an unnumian account, laws are elements of reality that are over and above the unnumian mosaic in some sense, um, that, and that govern or constrain the evolution of the unnumian mosaic. So there's a I at least suggested strong connection between there being a fundamental directionality in time and the um, uh, non numian account of laws, because governing looks like it's going in a particular temporal uh, direction. And I think that this is a connection that Tim embraces. Um, okay. On a non numian account, it's not clear to me how to think about dynamical probabilities, the probabilities that occur in the laws. Of course, it's always open to somebody to say it's just a primitive notion, it's just a primitive part of metaphysics of these probabilities. But to the extent that it's, it's probabilities, dynamical probabilities, in a non human way, you're given uh, content, we go along with it's what people sometimes call propensity accounts of probability. So if you think of, of the deterministic laws as governing so strictly the evolution of events, the probabilistic laws are kind of like nudging, and right? sort of nudge the events, guide them in some way. Um, that's a my metaphorical extension of the governing metaphor. Probably it's not a friendly one to like this account. Okay, so I understood, and this came from conversations I had with Shelley really, but now a while ago, so I don't know how ideas evolved. I understood typicality as being introduced um, for a couple of reasons. One is that Shelley thought, and even in a recent paper, I read this was repeated by him and Jolly and a few other people, everybody, uh, that you can't make sense of probability when you want to uh, uh, apply it to the whole universe because the universe occurs just once. So if you said that, you have a sort of frequency account of probability in mind. But it's an interesting thing about the Wiesian account, the Jungian account that I mentioned to you, that it um, does apply to the universe as a whole. It's not a frequency account, although it's not so different from an actual frequency account, because the actual frequencies in which various kinds of events occur will play a big role in determining what the right, what the laws are, what the probabilistic laws of the universe. Um, but typicality, typicality is what happens, like I said, most of the day at time. I'm stated to be correct in how I think about it. Um, and if there are infinitely many things that can happen, typicality needs to be characterized in terms of typicality measure. Um, and in certain circumstances, for certain dynamical laws at any rate, the typicality of measure 
is in some way, and I, I find this myself puzzling, I don't know exactly what to say, but in some way it's necessarily or a priori connected with the dynamics because of some special feature that the typicality measure has. And this came up in discussion the other day, for example, it's being stationary. And that would, insofar as somebody wants to talk about probabilities in the typicality account, probabilities that thought to be typical frequencies. And so the story about probabilities, probability of time applies to types of events, not the particular tokens. <coughs> and um, is uh, 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 understood in a, in a, a frequency way. Now, it could be could be developed as either a, a um, an actual frequency account or a hypothetical frequency account. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it would be developed as a hypothetical frequency account, but I know that Al Hayek has two papers. One says 15 things wrong with actual frequency accounts. Another one is 15 things wrong with hypothetical frequency accounts. So that seems to be enough things. So okay, could you go one the number three? If you don't understand why why is it necessary? A lot of energy necessary. So, so here's the question. Necessary connected to so the there's a question of what is the status of the typicality measure. It looks like either it's an additional law-like thing, so some, something in the world makes it right. Maybe if you're a union, it's something about the union mosaic. If you're a non-union, it's that um, <clears throat> Well, let me illustrate the difference between unions and non-unions here, and apply it to this case via a story which will lighten the mood here. Let's remind me a little bit. Um, so this is something that Tim and David were present at. Um, there was a conference really was quite a while ago at the, at the Einstein Institute in, outside of Berlin, in which um, you can see how long I've been going on about this stuff. This maybe was 12 years ago, at least, in which I was trying to explain the difference between union and non-union accounts, and I did it via a sort of myth or story like this. Think about what God had to do to create the universe. On the union account, what God had to do was to create the, God is outside of time, and just creates the whole universe from beginning to end. It's the whole plot universe. And then the laws are what we find by the criteria that we develop, the sciences looking for as in some way the best description, best systematization of the that human mosaic. So that's what God does, that's what we do. On the other account, the non-human account, the, the particular non-human account I'm talking about here, what God had to do was to create the initial conditions, set time going in a particular direction, and then create these laws to govern how the rest of the universe is formed. So this is what I said, and um, there were some journalists who came to this conference and wrote this up in the newspaper, or some, I don't know, some, some small journal paper, I'm not sure what paper it was, but I saw that my name was mentioned in the article, so I brought the paper back to Budapest, found some of the journal, so sort of read my name in German at least. Um, I brought it back to Budapest, and where my wife's mother was food, mm -hmm. and I gave it to her to tell me, what does this say here? And um, she started reading it, and then she started laughing hysterically, and then fell off her chair. Because it says, it says here that the theologian Barry Lohner then spoke and said. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now back to what you were asking about Daniel. So the, so the idea is, so far as I can see, if you, if you think you need to answer the question, is what the metaphysical status of the typical measure is. And you're a non-human, it looks like you're going to say one of two things. Either it comes out of necessity from the dynamical laws, or it's an additional add-on. So God had to do a little bit more work. Not only did he have to make up the dynamical laws, but he had to make the typicality measure. Among people I've read who talk about the typicality measure. I'm sure this will come up in my discussion with Dustin Jones, because he has some interesting ideas about this. The idea is, you know, it's not quite necessary, but it's not quite not necessary either. And I'm not sure exactly where that comes down. Is this, what, is this what, something you're going to be interested in? Why, 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 why,
first one day the dynamical laws and then completely forget about them and create a typicality measure that is not connected with those. I mean, why, why did, is he forced to do the two things in a <coughs> coherent way? What, what, what why is God forced to be coherent? No, no, no. <laughs> what, 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 no, no. <laughs> why does God need to construct these two things for which he, in principle, has a freedom? So why does he have to do it in, a, in, 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 in some is the mysterious you're going to believe? The typicality measure, they don't have to be mysteriously connected. They might not be connected at all. Okay, but that's what they read when they, sorry, so this is it made perhaps an Typicality measure is necessarily a very connected with the This is a view that I've heard from people who like the typicality view. But I'm perfectly open to people who like this view to say, no, I don't think that at all. But then you wonder, so where does the typicality measure come from? Well, it may come from a separate act of, of, of God. You have to do two things. You have to create the typicality measure. So I don't think I know what typicality and periodic connected with the dynamics means, but maybe that's something I'd ask to address rather than... It, I think it means that you know what the dynamics are. You don't need anything more, any more empirical. See, that's the part anything. I don't know. I don't know how the dynamics could pick out the typical typicality measure. It's not up for me to answer that. Like, that's, why, that's why I said maybe that's what it does mean. And does say too much, but I, I do want to say about this slide. If you don't understand the notion of typicality, you don't believe this because <laughs> you're getting very confused. Okay. I, I am. And, and let me at least say a couple ways in which you get it. Typicality is not what happens most of the time. If it, if it were, then you couldn't appeal to it to explain why certain things happen most of the time. That would just be circular. Typicality means, it's not defined in terms of what actually happens. It's defined in terms of the, of the space of initial conditions. And the basic idea is that something's typical if, oh, if, if it would happen for overwhelmingly most initial conditions. Yeah. Now, of course, in order to make sense of that phrase, you need to make sense of overwhelmingly most. One way to do that, but not the only way, is to actually have a measure, a, a mathematical measure, and measure the initial conditions by that and look for a number near one. But you can actually get away with much less than that. That's one of the points about typicality. You can, you can actually, logically, all you really need is a characterization of some sets of initial conditions as overwhelmingly most without having to put a real number on it or anything. You just, you just need a predicate, big set. And then something is typical if the set of initial conditions that give rise to it is big. That says nothing. It says zero about what actually happens. Both so both so you're, you're right, of course. And, and I, I was but, but you, you, you have was, one, and then you're, you're just completely lost. You're not going to understand anything, because that's just completely off target as to what this is. But, this is now I, mean, I don't see that part, but so let me just answer you. So you're right. The way I crossed the calendar was my unionism was creeping in, okay, because I was giving the account in terms of what actually happens. But you're right, of course, it's, it's some of the, the State of the possibility of counting the possible initial conditions of the state. But it's still a notion of most. And the right notion of most now, what's the right one, is, is, is now the question is, well, how is that connected right. to the dynamic of the laws? And it connects to there, it seems to be what you said, two things about it. One is, well, it, you don't have to have a particular typicality measure. Many, many measures will work to give you what you want. But there are some measures that will work to give you what you don't want also. So there's still a gap to be filled in here. Yeah, you need okay. it. And the question is, what is doing the filling in here? Right. Is it some facts about the world? Like like, like a non human might think about a law. Is a fact about, it's an actual fact about the world. But a certain law holds in the actual world. Mm -hmm. okay. But Barry, I think you mean, is it a fact about the world other than the dynamics? The yes. dynamics is, of course, no, of course, that was the implicit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, 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 is the question is that once you got the dynamics in place, is there is it is, is it a further fact? Is there a further fact like 
um, God had to t pick a typicality measure? Or which the answer is, this is of course an atheist, but like we're not theologians on our side either. So God doesn't have to do anything. Yeah, so the question is, is there an extra factor that up? Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, that's so given the that, yeah, so given that it states based on the dynamics, there's going to be oodles of kinds of measures on, on, on right. things. Does the dynamics pick out one or a class of well, those measures as the right look, one? Look, let's put it, so let me yeah. just answer this with you. At least certain kinds of dynamics, not the dynamics you yeah. can think of, certain kinds of dynamics do privilege certain measures, namely those measures that are preserved under the dynamics. That's just so a what's fact. For, what's for, for what kind of logical relationship? <coughs> it, some measures satisfy this, overwhelmingly most don't. I mean, again, mm -hmm. intuitively, overwhelmingly most don't. A small set do. No, that's not the question. There's a relation between a measure and a dynamics. No, 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 the question only is. Only certain measures satisfy. So that, that's true. Some things are stationary and some measures are, are not. So, but why should the right to the cabinet measure? Right. Right. So, I, I mean, one answer to that is because if you, you want to make judgments about which sets of initial conditions are big, okay, and you don't want the following thing to happen, that you use a criterion which, if I apply it at time t0, it says, of all initial conditions, this is a big set. And then I let that set evolve under the dynamics to T1. And now I apply the same criterion, and it says it's no longer a big set. Big sets should remain big. No. But that means that, the, no. that this has to interact with the dynamics in the right way. If you don't, then what you're doing just is incoherent. Ah, so it is. So, so the so claim is. Like the yeah, yeah, so the claim is that it's a logical entailment, that the only thing that could serve. As, as the appropriate measure over initial conditions. If, if given the dynamics, right. it's a logical matter. You say it's incoherent of it. This, this is, this would be, again, you don't even have to use a, a, a mathematical measure at all. But if you are, and you're not using one that's equivariant, then yes, what the, your, your judgments of largeness and smallness will not cohere with each other. At, at different times. Basically. At different times. Yeah. But, so what? Bad, but, but perhaps only at, perhaps it's only at the initial time. Yeah. So, so there what? There will be some special law. That's that right. It's I mean, perhaps you only have to say this about the initial. I don't. I don't understand. I, I'm not understand, understanding the picture you have. I have a. I have a phase space or a, 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 a space of possible instantaneous space. <laughs> I want to be able to say some sets of those, they're huge, they're almost all of them, okay? And if you have a deterministic dynamics and you have some criterion that's not a time index criterion, okay? And you say, okay, initially, this set is almost all the possible states, and now I wait 10 minutes and apply the very same criterion, and I say my big set has become small, that just doesn't make any sense. Okay, I, that, that's very clear. And the raises the question: What's wrong with the time index criteria? Right. So someone could say, for example, okay, here's a special time early in the universe, and we want to talk about typical, put a typicality measure over the space of, of possible conditions at that time, and then whatever the actual dynamics are, evolve them forward and say, okay, something is typical a billion years from now, if the set of things are initial conditions that lead to it, all of it is big on, right. on the initial so, right. so there is so an it's time it's time in that. So there is an answer. answer. So that's not even coherent. I, 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 again, this, this, is, this, this discussion strikes me <laughs> that the, the spirit of it is very peculiar. People can do pretty much anything, right? They can do all kinds of things we've been all crazy that are not, you know, strictly logically incoherent, but are totally unmotivated. You can't understand why anybody would do that. You're trying to capture an intuitive judgment that we all make. Like if I say a typical real number is irrational. Now I can make that precise relative to a bed measure, but that seems a little bit overkill. 
But this is also true relative to pretty much any reasonable measure. So we want to know right now. Tim, unless Tim, you had some weird idea that you wanted you know, the strange measure to make, you know, oh, a big, tiny set huge. Tim. And, and you wonder why are you doing yeah, it? You mentioned the, the Penrose proposal, right? Let's say right. at the Planck scale, at the scale in which the curvature, the mean curvature of the, you know, curvature at every point in the universe, the scalar curvature, is at the Planck scale, at that time, the vial curvature is zero. And there are yeah. some, and, and, and let's arrange a measure in such a way that those things at that time are overwhelming, right. have an overwhelming measure. But at later times, the, veil, the, the evolution will take us to situations in which the veil measure, you know, will Will, will, will not be zero. I'm, I'm, and, and I'm not the, understanding what the, the virus is. Can, can can I, I'm not understanding what you. Penrose's suggestion, as I understand it, was you want to say we, we know the initial state after the Big Bang has to be very low energy. And we want <coughs> a, as it were, easy to state criterion or, or uh, uh, property that it had that made it very low entropy. You know, other than saying it just has to be some low entropy state or other right one. And, and one example would be an easy to state criterion would be the watt mile curvature was zero or near zero. So that's not a, that's not a measure of anything. That's just a, no, that's just a, that's the just the a property. If I, if I arrange the measure in such a way, what the, in the oh, this, 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 this uh, <coughs> the measure of initial states. Yeah. The, the, the measure that I'm going to use in this type part, if I arrange the measure in such a way that most of the possible initial conditions according to that measure are those that have vial curvature zero, yeah. it will not be the case that as I evolve those initial data, Right, and if you think the, the great majority of things will have, it, will remain valid. If, if you do that, you're also going to not even say the initial state was low entropy. You're going to say it was high entropy. And now you're just doing something that has no connection to what anybody does. I mean, you know, Penrose starts off with God with his, you know, little pointer pointing out a very, very specific tiny state in a huge volume, right? Which is an indication that by the by the measure that makes it puzzling that the Big Bang was like that, the Big Bang state was a, was one that was had to come from a very 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 small specific set of possible initial conditions. Right now, if you change the measure on initial conditions so that the Big Bang state is now most of them, then you no longer have a problem at all. Then you say, oh, those are typical. Then you would say, what's to explain? Typical, relative to that measure, the Big Bang state was typical. Now, that just normally strikes people as cheating. It's just saying something that we found puzzling. I'm going to introduce a completely arbitrary, artificial measure not connected to anything, whose only job is to say, don't be puzzled. So, Tim, I mean, so, Tim can I get, can I? I just want us to try to be careful here, and I, I want to understand what you're trying to say. A few minutes ago, you said that, that assigning a measure that's non-stationary according to the dynamics would just be incoherent. Right. Then a few minutes later, it seemed like you took that back. And you said, look, um, yes, people can do anything they want. You know, a lot of things are coherent. Um, but. Uh, but I don't know what, but we, we all acknowledge that this or that is puzzling or something like that. Because two then, different things Hold happen. on, Tim, hold on a yeah. second. Two different things happen. One is incoherent and one is unlimited. I wanted to But, but, but look, this, this is a really important point. I mean, and, and it's going to help me understand your position if we can get clear about it. Good. So can I it's a, no, 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 but can I, can I ask what's puzzling me? Yeah. Um, um, the position seems not to be at the end that it would be logically incoherent to combine the dynamics 
with some probability measure over initial conditions that was non-stationary. Right? It wouldn't be no, you're here. not making the right distinction. So can I explain? Sure. Suppose one did not time index anything. One just said, among the state of all possible initial yeah, conditions yeah. of GR, the ones with vial curvature zero are overwhelmingly most of them. Right. Okay. Then you would be in an incoherent position of saying, I have a, an ensemble <coughs> of pearls. Overwhelmingly, most of them start out with vial curvature zero. And then that set, which is overwhelmingly most, evolves. And after a few billion years, they're no longer overwhelmingly most, because they will no longer have vial curvature zero. Mm -hmm. That you would be saying a small set evolved into a big set. But, but they have a one-to-one -one correspondence between early states and late states. Okay. So, so the idea is where do not deter deterministic laws, each early state evolves into a unique late state. What counts as a big set at time t zero better evolve into what counts as a big set at later times under the dynamics. If you don't do that, then it's incoherent. Now, one way out of that is to get rid of the time indexing and say, let's just say this, the, the, the set of states at time t zero that have vial curvature zero is overwhelmingly most. And at a later time, what's overwhelmingly most is whatever the hell that set evolves into, right. which will not be things with vial curvature right. zero. Right. Right. That's not incoherent. That's just unmotivated. I, I'd like to speak to the claim it's unmotivated, but I suspect David has something to say first. No, that's OK. Go ahead. OK. <laughs> I, um, I don't think it's unmotivated, um, and actually, if you, if you look at the sort of appeals that typicality a scientist might actually make, it is a kind of So suppose someone's doing cosmological modeling, so someone wants to study galaxy formation. Obviously, they're not going to try to come up with a computer model that gives us exactly the Milky Way model, <laughs> Milky Way here, Andromeda galaxy here. What they look is for certain patterns, clustering, power spectrum and clustering, and see if they can get something like the patterns of clustering <coughs> that we have. And it better not be that they have to assume very special initial conditions in order to do that. So they might have a, a idea of well, typical conditions of the early universe uh, uh, um, uh, 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 prior to there being galaxies will lead to the sort of power spectrum of, power, uh, of, of clustering there. And then, so what's typical early is there's no galaxies, and, and then you say what's <coughs> typical later is there are galaxies with a certain kind of distribution of, 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 of clustering. And that's not just being unmotivated, it seems to be totally natural. Right. I, even if it were unmotivated, it doesn't really answer the question of what the connection is between the dynamics. And right. So I, I, think, I think we often do employ a time index, a non state and, and, and obviously that's a, a, a non state you're using a non-stationary measure there. Mm -hmm. I, yeah? No, I just, I, 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 what you describe is not what I describe. I agree. But what I'm claiming is what I describe is not unmotivated, it's well motivated. But the only sense in which the later states are typical, again, is that overwhelmingly most of the initial conditions, subject to whatever macro, macro constraints. Right. The difference is you put macro constraints on the initial conditions. Okay? okay? You don't put them, if you put macro constraints on the later states, like, oh, they have to contain galaxies right. and blah, blah, blah. Right. One thing you're not doing is explaining this galaxy formation. Explaining galaxy formation means giving an account of why a situation without galaxies right. evolves into a state with galaxies. Right. And now, if you start with, the, you, you have a macro description of the initial states, which don't contain galaxies, right. and you have some judgment about what counts as overwhelmingly most of those. Right. And if you show that overwhelmingly most of those then evolve via the dynamics into galaxies, you now explain galaxies. Exactly. Formation. That's perfectly fine. But you didn't do what you just said. You didn't, I did do what I just said. Used, I you, never, just, you just described what I just said. Um, no, but then you, that's not, no. You didn't hear the words. What? I, I, I didn't use a time index notion of typicality. You did, but you didn't use those words. 
No, I didn't. And that's why I didn't, that's why I didn't use the words. So, let's continue. <laughs> sort of beside the point of the main issue here. The issue is, what is the logical or metaphysical, or whatever you want to call it, relationship that, between the dynamics and the typicality? Right. Yeah, I've yeah. read about the idea that the dynamics by itself could determine a, a, a um, typicality method, right? And, and I, I don't see any necessary connection between typicality. I mean, Tim, you could certainly suggest Tim, that. I mean, I, surely the well, claim is the word, the word necessary. Surely the claim is not that that there is any probability or, or, or typicality measure that you could put over initial conditions which is somehow logically inconsistent with the dynamics. I, and that's not what I said. What I said was well, we have the criteria for largeness that is not time indexed, okay? That is not time indexed. Then it better, then be better cohere with the dynamics, or you get the incoherent condition that a large set evolves into. But a why in the world should one be one under a one to one? So that, so that, on that way problem. of putting it, why in the world shouldn't it be time indexed? I right, don't get exactly. that at all. So we're all agreed that if it's not time indexed, then in the sense that you're describing, yeah. yeah. Why in the world shouldn't it be time indexed? Well, the, I, I don't, I mean, again, I, yeah, I don't understand. The, the way you're using it is, as you know, you have a macro constraint on the initial state. That macro constraint is consistent with all the hell kind of things happening. Like, the, the macro constraint could make the initial state low entropy, and it's consistent with that, that the damn thing goes even lower. Right. Right? The mac, you know, and, and you want to get the Maxwell Boltzmann velocity distribution. It doesn't have to get there. We all know, as Shelley says, there are bad states. There are good states, and there are bad states. <laughs> and what we think we have, what we count as an explanation, if in some reasonable sense, the good states are overwhelmingly most of them. You're never going to make the bad states go away, right? But what's important for the explanatory purposes is the measure at zero, okay. and that it be a coherent measure that is, you don't, you, again, certain principles for this measure would not be intertemporally coherent. Why? Right. I, Why? I think I can, I can clear something for you here. So, Wayne is saying that you're using a time index measure of typicality because what is typical at late times in the universe is not what is typical at early times in the universe. But what you're saying is you're not using a time index notion of typicality because you're saying relative to the macro constraints, you're using the same measure of typicality, and it's just the case that the macro constraints later in the universe are different from the macro constraints early in the universe. Would that be right? No. What is typical or not typical are behaviors. Okay? Behaviors. Like forming galaxies. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't make but, sense but, on the way I'm using the term to say Forming galaxies is not typical in the early universe, but typical in later universe. No, but that's typical. Let me just finish. What's typical or not typical is, given that you're starting with, say, a bunch of diffuse gas, is it or is it not typical for that to form galaxies? And that is answered by saying, is the set of initial conditions that yield that transtemporal behavior overwhelmingly most of the initial conditions there are. Right. Correct. And, just, and to say overwhelmingly most, you're using typicality measure to say what is the big set. Yes. Right. You need something to, do, to, do, to, to identify large sets. Right. But the only large. place you needed to identify the large set was at the initial time. Now I'm really confused. You were saying before, um, um, I have to have this transtemporal notion where large sets are identified early on correspond to judgments about large sets later. But now you're saying typicality, you know, I, I don't apply, I, I, I apply typicality to behaviors, not, yes. to, not to situations at a time. Yes, I, I mean, the, the tip, what you want to explain has to do with, with behavior. You ask, is it typical for such and such to happen? Good. And we have a deterministic theory, so those right. behaviors can be mapped into initial conditions. Yes. Good. So we want a typicality measure over initial conditions, which is the same as a typicality measure over behavior. 
It will, because it will the yield one. Right. It will yield one. Yeah, right. Good. So it's getting more and more puzzling why, why you're insisting that, that the measure of bigness as opposed to smallness not be time in this. Uh, because, of, of course, there is no actual initial state. You want to be able to do this choosing anything as your initial state and applying it in this way and getting a judgment about what is typical to happen. So if just Tim, if Which you means add, the measure has to be equal variable. No. Tim, 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 if you add that as a requirement, it counts as a kind of measure. And it sounds like you think there's an analytic connection between the dynamical laws. Right. And the there is a the there is a necessary condition for this concept to be deployed coherently. You want to call that an analytic connection? Fine. Yeah. I don't care. It's a necessary condition to deploy it coherently. I mean, I, I, it's not a one to call it. It is, it is, right? And Fine. All, I was, it's, 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 all it's, I was interested in is clarifying this issue, yeah. which it sounds like it's now been clarified by understanding the conditions that you put on the typicality measure, right. the typicality measure, and once those conditions are on it, on the typicality measure, it turns out that the dynamics entails a unique. No, it's a necessary condition. Yeah, it's not sorry, not unique. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a criteria. Yeah, it's, right. it's, it's a necessary condition. Right. It's not a sufficient one. You, you could probably find measures that are equivariant that are still not the one. Sure. That are absolutely not the right. Sure. That, yeah. That's right. So, so, but, so, but you've clarified the, the relationship between it, and the, the clarification came by way of you making explicit a condition on the typical, the typical yeah. measure. Yeah. Good. So that's an answer to the to the question. I wasn't raising it as an objection. Okay. It was just as a feature. So, suppose I settled on a typicality measure that's that, 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 that a stationary measure. It doesn't have to be stationary, it's Okay. Um, okay. So, um, the, 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 okay, the psychovariant. And suppose it turns out that um, typical states according to that measure are ones in which everything's in thermal equilibrium. And so on the basis of my theory, I make a prediction about the conditions in the early universe. Mm -hmm. It's close to thermal equilibrium. Right. I can test that prediction. Right. It sounds like I've got in the most very thoroughly falsified theory. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The universe. Absolutely you do. And that tells you you need another principle you haven't yet taken into account, namely the past hypothesis. And then you want to be able to form, formulate the past hypothesis in a you know, mathematically and logically sharp way, which we don't really have, to, right? That's what the vial curvature equals zero would be. If right. That were. Right. So Tim's right. saying once you specify the macro state, then you use the typicality measure, not before. So and then, and then, then that gives us a time index notion of typicality. No, no, it doesn't. <clears throat> no, because that later it comes after the past hypothesis. At the time of the past hypothesis. I mean. Uh, Dustin was going to yes, I, I mean, I can also spoil that later, but what, what, what I would say to this point, so first, I think that Barry and David are really pushing for hard logical criteria in the sense that does the right to become measure deductively follow from the dynamics. And I think, this, I think that it does, and I think that it would be an unreasonably uh, strong Strong thing to to have to expect. It's just we are giving criteria that makes it to be reality measure justified, natural, or reasonable. Not that makes it you know, logically follow uniquely in a purely deductive way from the dynamical law. And that um, a measure that would not be natural or justified in this sense wouldn't be logically coherent. It just couldn't play the explanatory role that it's supposed to. We also would give the wrong results. No, I get the right results, but yeah. still be unreasonable. Sure. Right. right, Mike. But 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 right. But if, if it's likely it will be the wrong results. I mean, if we look at the calendar, look, if, if, if a bunch of students in my class, I look at their exams, and they're all word for word identical. And I say, you know, you guys, I know you cheated. And they say, no, 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 no. 
Here's a typicality measure relative to which, for typical initial conditions, we all give the same answers without looking at each other's papers. I'm not going to accept that. There is, there is, you know, they can come up with some answer, but it is, it is ad hoc and, and unmotivated. Uh, no, it's because it's because it's highly on their story is highly unlikely, given the correct probability distribution or typicality measure, the empirically correct one, over initial conditions of the world. Why? Theirs is just relative to this particular exam. Everything else goes through exactly the same. Like I said, there's these two they points actually that they throw mm -hmm. things to each other. <laughs> right, right, but so, so, so you talk I, about, I, sorry, you, yeah, you go. Yeah, uh, just what, what I like to say about station, stationarity or like variance, and I'm not sure it helps, helps everybody, but maybe it helps some understand what we actually want to quantify in the end are not microstates but possible worlds to say what sort of behavior occurs, what properties are instantiated in the vast majority of nomologically possible worlds. And equivariance of stationarity um, is just then the formal condition to get a canonical measure on the solution space from a measure on the microscopic state space. Right. So it's, it's, uh, otherwise, yeah, it's, it's just like uh, choosing a particular time slice to parameterize a uh, solution trajectory or possible worlds. Just like choosing a particular coordinatization of of some of the uh, solution space. Right. And um, yes, which is some question begging. Question or just dubious if our notion of typicality depended on dependent on one particular coordinatization of this of the solution space. That said, there are special theories in which there may be a distinguished moment in time, so that it does make sense to parameterize solution trajectories uh, by their um, configuration at that distinguished moment in time. And one example that comes to mind that some of you know is this theory of Julian Barber's uh, with the Janus point um, that comes from a relational formulation of, uh, of Newtonian gravity and then each uh, trajectory goes through a unique point of, um, of minimal shape complexity. And then he does choose a typicality measure in which he parameterizes possible worlds by the configuration at this Janus point. So this is a very special theory, a very special circumstances where it does might make sense to have a time index uh, notion of a time index notion of typicality or time index typicality measure because the theory is such that solution project that possible solutions have a distinguished a distinguished moment in time. Luke is going to So, just to try and pull this apart, you, you talked about bad states. There are bad states that do, you know, unlikely things. It better be the case that the typicality measure, measure says those things are small. That's a small set. Right. But it seems like, okay, now we've got the dynamics, and there's, there's a bunch of typicality measures I could put on the dynamics, and I, I'm totally with you, we should go for the equivariant ones. But within that set, there could be bad measures. And, in, and uh, there are, if there are bad measures, then it seems like you've, you're up with a new, there better be a typical measure which says that a, a good, these bad measures are a small, it, and it, then you're, you're, you're it, layering it, measures on measures. It, it just depends on, and, and, I, and I, I agree with, I, I agree entirely with, Dust, with what Dustin said, that there is an underlying notion of what's reasonable. And, and this is not, this is different from what's just logically coherent or what's well motivated, right? And I don't know that you solve, you don't solve all these problems by putting a measure on things. Um, I, one thing to say is, and I, I, you know, Barry has some measures. I say, from, from a logical point of view, at least as I reconstruct the logic of this, what you really need is not a measure that is an actual thing that assigns real numbers to measurable subsets. You just need a single predicate, big set. Okay. okay. Well, then, and, I mean, and some sets are big, and their complements are small, and anything that's neither big or small is neither big or small. It seems like you can put those both on states and on on 
you need to have a predicate about the predicate, right? Like most of the, uh, well, uh, and, and let me just, you know, <coughs> that, that there might be different kind of equally seemingly motivated, like in the, in, the, in the test case, of course you can come up with a measure that makes that big set. I mean, of course there are you know, an infinite number of measures, but that's completely unmotivated except that they don't want to get punished, right? I mean, um, and now you might say that, 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 that there aren't enough conditions of reasonableness to pick out a unique real measure, probability measure. Yes. And then you want to say, but that's if all of them agree on which sets are big and which sets are small, which for many of these purposes they will, right? So if you if you're doing a, a, a sort of th think of a a, a a space of initial states and put a flat measure on it, and, and then put a measure that's not flat but is not wildly fractal, but you know doesn't vary a lot, it's sort of smooth, and you've got a chaotic dynamics. This is the kind of thing that people prove. They say, well, you know, what counts as a big set? with respect to the kinds of outcomes we care about under this will be the same as under this. Right. Because they mix so much, and, you know. And, and so you say, look, there's a very robust notion of bigness that will be agreed upon by pretty much any measure it might occur to you to use, in, except you had some very ad hoc, weird thing you were trying to do. It, it seems like you, you put it in that sentence as they've said, it will be agreed on by a typical measure. But you better not say that. Yes. Then I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't reach the typical there. Yeah. I would. I would say any any measure that seems motivated. Okay. Right. They don't disagree on this. Now they may disagree on the fine details of what's the real numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. But as long as they don't disagree that this is a really big set and that's a really small set, and if that's what's the, playing the explanatory role here, then you're going to say, okay, use any of them, and maybe you use. You know, uh, Louisville measure because it's the simplest one to calculate with. You know, because you actually want to be able to prove things. But you say, having done that, okay, change it from Louisville measure in any not too crazy way, and you'll get the same results, right? You'll, you'll make the same judgments. So, so the question that arose I, I in my mind is it's really a metaphysical question um, on the probability count. You mean probability count? It's clear that there are facts about the union mosaic that makes a particular probability measure the probability, the right, the right probability measure. Uniquely the right one? Well, it, it may not be unique because it depends on the criteria of what the, uh, the criteria that some Right, so, so what did you mean to say? Just what I said. No, what you said is there, that, that, that it the makes one the right, right one. And then I said okay. there is no so, right So it one. might be a set of all right but, it's it, but, but what I was focusing on is that it's facts about the world that makes this the right set or makes it the right one. So it wasn't that I was, I wasn't disputing with you, so I didn't no, no, I just, any reason to come back on that. But do you believe but, there is a one right one? That's what I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. Do you believe there is one right it, one? That, right that, that depends no. on whether there's a unique best system winner or not. Okay. And there might be there, there might not be. And there, there might be and there might not be. There might be a set of probabilities. But that wasn't what I wanted to focus on. Right. I wanted to focus on the answer that's given from that side. Yeah. The answer is it's a contingent fact about the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, even once the equations of motion are studied. Even right, that's yes. Right. Okay. The question that I was right bringing up is what is the metaphysical status of the measure on the typicality, the typicality measure on the typicality account? Yes. Okay. And what I've heard a lot of is how it would be in poor taste to pick a time index measure or more, uh, measure of big sets because so small sets and so on. I agree with that, of course. And it would give really there are lots of measures that do that, which would give results that have to, uh, completely counter or aiming to do is to recover uh, uh, the third analytical and other laws. So it's certainly right, but it doesn't answer the question of what the metaphysical connection is. And somebody might reject that question, which it sounds like a lot of the top I, 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 I don't think this is metaphysics. I think this is normativity, understanding, and explanation. Okay. I don't think so, so so this is some, that a subfield so, of metaphysics. So let's. So so my reason for bringing up the little. The, uh, the, the God story was to make it clearly a metaphysical uh, 
Okay, so yeah, that's a disagreement. I so that's I, I, I would not put these questions in 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 the box of medical. So the reason I'm putting it in that box is I think here's a claim. The claim is that this is the right typicality measure that has consequences for all sorts of ordinary claims that we think of as contingent claims by the world, like whether the gas will, will expand or not expand. And so it looks as though, to me, as though it must be some facts about the world that makes this the right. Okay, so let me, let me in the normal jujitsu way, turn your feature into a bug. Okay? Yeah, your criterion is clearly empirical. That makes the explanatory force circular. That's a, that's a different argument okay. that we can have. That's not a bug for me. Yeah, it's a, it's a bug. Okay, you like circular. It's a bug. I don't like circular. No, it's not. It's, but I think it's not circular. I think it's a bug that has been successfully squashed. Well, <laughs> it, it obviously raises the issue of circularity. It raises the issue. Whereas, whereas if, if the status of the measure has this normative character that's actually independent of the particular things that happen, then you can understand why you think that as long as things happen the right way, it counts as an explanation. Well, I'm not sure about that. But I do, I do agree that there's the, the appearance of circularity. But this applies to the whole union. Yeah, it sure does. Much much and so it's really important for the union to give an answer. I think it, an answer has been given to that. And we could go off of the discussion about that. But you know, it's a, a, a literature that's sprung up for the last few years or that. Just raise a question, I think I will clarify something to say that I think I'm confused. What would be wrong in trying to, I mean, you said, if I, if I, if I give initial data without giving this, uh, what's the name? No, 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 that's the that I mentioned. Sorry? Past hypothesis. The past hypothesis. Without giving the past hypothesis, I'm going to give it very bad results and, yeah. and so forth. What would be wrong to try to get rid of the bad hypothesis by choosing an appropriate typicality measure that would make well, rid of having the, the, again, used it's, the it's, bad hypothesis? Good. Everything is packed into the word appropriate. So a, a blunt thing to do, which I think fails, is to say, well, what I mean by appropriate is just one that gives me what I see. And that you can do, but then you say, all you're saying is things, you know, the universe started out in a way it had to start out to give me what I see. That's just not explanatory. Yes. To think that I've got an explanation, what makes it appropriate, have to, it, it has to have the feel of invoking an ind kind of independent principle. As I say, like file curvature equals zero. Where, wherever that comes from, maybe that comes from somewhere else. Even if it comes from nowhere else, you say, oh, that's a kind of, you know, that's a kind of condition that I can specify. And I don't specify it by saying a condition that leads to galaxies later on, right? If I say, oh, at the beginning, here's, you know, you need an initial condition that leads to galaxies later on. Why? Because there are galaxies later on. You say, okay, but now I'm not getting an explanation. You're just saying things had to start out in the right way to give us what we see. That doesn't count as an explanation. What you want is some kind of mo motivated, independent principle that seems to have explanatory force. Now, the notion of explanatory force is very subtle and difficult. And I don't think it's metaphysics. I think this is in, 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 you're in the theory of understanding, you're in the theory of normativity, of what counts as comprehending something. I think these are very difficult issues, Fine, but that, those, that's where the issues lie. But what's the difference between invoking this uh, What's the name of the principle? Past hypothesis. The past hypothesis. The past hypothesis. Because, I mean, it's, it's, it can be stated in a simple way, right. I guess. It can be stated okay. in a simple way, and, and especially provides account for what we seem to see around. This is a very important point. The past hypothesis can be stated in a simple way, and then accounts for what right. we Yes, have. right. But why is it more, why is this okay and it's not okay to do that through the, through the uh, typicality measure? Right. Right? Why couldn't I just right. do it in the same way by the typicality measure? Right. And, and I'm, say, I'm and not sure what you're, 
you'd have to, I don't, I'm not sure what you're doing. We had two issues, okay? We had an issue that if you, if you invoked a typicality measure that was not time indexed and was not appropriately harmonized with the dynamics, it would just be incoherent. Can't do that, right? But it would be coherent in the sense of in the sense that what counts as a large set, what counts as a large set would evolve under the dynamics into what counts as a small set, and it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. That doesn't make any sense. If a set's big, it's big. If it's small, it's small. It can't evolve from big to small. You're just because you're just counting in a deterministic world. You're just counting trajectories. Okay, in a deterministic world, you have unique trajectories, and really, what you want is a measure of the trajectory. And you better not use a measure that says, oh, at time t equals zero, this set of trajectories is a big set, but at time Tim, t if it's more, a measure the very same set of trajectories is a small set. No, Tim, if it's a measure over trajectories, then that's fine. You've got a deterministic theory. You set a measure over trajectories by setting a measure over one time, states at one time. They're completely equivalent to one another. You bet, uh, if you're, look, I don't understand what you mean. If you have a condition that can only be applied at one time, that's going to be really puzzling because there ain't no special time. Yeah, but the, 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 the time on which yeah, there is a there, there is a special time. time. There, there's a time when that measure is simple to specify. Okay, when that measure, as a measure over microstates, instantaneous microstates, is particularly simple to specify. If it's equal, look, equivariance is a condition that's simple to specify. I, I don't understand why you're, you're, you know, you're painting your, you're trying to say, isn't the following weird thing that kind of nobody wants to do something you could do? And I'm not sure why I have to be arguing. It's not something that the typicality people want. Is it something you have to do? I'm getting lost. <laughs> so is this, a, is this a summary of what it is? This? The question came up, what's the relationship, the, the metaphysical relationship and the epistemic relationship between the dynamical laws and the typicality measure? Mm -hmm. And the answers seem to be this. It's willing to ask the metaphysical question. It's not a metaphysical relation at all. There is an epistemic relation. It's something along the lines of, this is the reasonable, the, it's reasonableness. It is dynamical laws. This is the reason. That, no, that's, that, that's, there was more subtlety in the discussion. If you don't time index the measure, like pick out a, a single special time in the universe, but you want a generically applicable condition for specifying the measure, then it has to cohere with the dynamics. That, that is a logical fact. I think what. Okay, so the, so the answer is given uh, this condition on the measure, which is a reasonable condition to put on the measure, it logically follows that the measure, uh, that this necessary condition on the, this necessary condition on the measure will follow. Yeah. My, okay. So that's it. So that's, that's a coherence condition. Right. I, I only wanted to do was to summarize it, okay. where this was. So that's the answer that the typicality side gives to this question. Why equal variance? That, that's the answer if you say, why do you care so much about equal variance? It's because actually you don't want to time index the thing. Yeah. And you if you want something that's so not time it's also indexed, an answer, it has to be so It's also an answer to why this measure. Uh, because it, it, it no, because there, there, there could be equal variances does not necessarily think out a unique measure. There could be lots of equal variances. That's right. And why is it? You still may, may say that's some of them are reasonable and some of them aren't. Some of them are compelling and some of them aren't. So I think maybe I'm what Daniel was getting at was it seems like you if you've got here's the space uh, and the, here's the space of all possible initial states mm -hmm. and you've got a typicality measure, you could encode the path hypothesis in the typicality right. measure. Right. You don't need a separate path hypothesis. You, you say right. these, no, none of those, and in here, typically these ones are big for this small. You right. could, but I wouldn't. Okay. I would I would make the past hypothesis a logically independent additional condition which either is primitive or itself is subject to some further explanation. Right. Like, you know, in, in, in Penrose's, you know, uh, cosmology, maybe there's an explanation for it. I would just take those as independent conditions. Now you might say, oh, I could bundle them together, 
And I guess, in principle, I could, but I don't see any advantage to doing that. I see a big disadvantage to doing that. Because I think it just may have a different status. And is that what you were getting? Maybe? Well, let, let me tell you the motivation why I'm bringing all these things. Because in my case, it's motivated. We have dreamt a scheme by which you would account for the past hypothesis. And the scheme is the following. Think of something like CSL theory and make the make the CSL parameter depend on by the square. And the reason we want the this is because we wanted to use collapse theories to account for the information problem. What is the dependence on vowel square just so I understand? I mean, I, okay, it kind of increases it increases dramatically with by. So the collapse rate is, a, is something very slow in our ordinary conditions, you know, but yeah. enough to account for the fact that if you put 10 to 23 particles... And oh, you're, you're worried about black holes and stuff. Yeah, like, so, it's really, so, so it still so, counts as small now. Right, it's small now. Okay. Inside black holes, collapses occur very, very quickly. You erase information very, very quickly because you are but, start approaching the... Yeah. Let me think. Yeah. So we were led to this idea that, they, that you, of a theory of CSL type with strong dependence on right. bile. In such a way that when bile is very large, you get a, more you, rapid. You, you get more rapid yeah, yeah, yeah. approach. And then you think, you write the evolution equation, and you see, well, this evolution equation is made out of two parts. Let me write, I, I don't know if, can I write something? No. So, so, so the type of the, the way your state evolves according to CSL, well, this is the time order of the operator, and then you have the standard Hamiltonian part, and then this this other thing that is controlled by the parameter lambda that that depends on, on, on the, stochastic, the stochastic thing and and, and and certain operator that plays the role of collapse operator. In, in, Normally, it's taken to be a position operator, a near position operator, but we are thinking in a broader context, so let me leave it open for a moment. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the way it evolves, starting from, from time to zero, let's say. Time T. And this is the stochastic form. So, we have these two types of evolution, right? <coughs> Now imagine that this parameter depends dramatically on, cur on, on, on the vial curvature. In such a way that when the vial curvature is very large, this is the evolution that you get. At that point, your evolution is completely stochastic, because this, is over this term is completely overwhelmed, overwhelms this. Then you are jumping around from place to place without even creating a coherent space-time without... Well, it's funny because I put time there, but without having anything that resembles a universe as we can. And you keep going and going and going and people, by chance eventually you arrive to right a situation with, in which Vi is very small, extremely small, zero. Then at that point Hamiltonian evolution takes over and you start. And then if that's the case, you would say Normal evolution, an evolution that is more or less orderly, that would produce a universe that grows or has any potential of behaving like a, the kind of evolution that we have, will have to start with by very close to zero. Can, can I, I? I'm not sure I understand why turning up the parameter would be the chaos. Because well, because this is this is the stochastic this is the, this complete this is the stochastic function of time, right? Right, but each collapse narrows you down. In other words, in my head, I do a collapse, maybe the wave function was pretty spread out, and now in, in the appropriate space it's now narrow. Which means if I now rapidly have another collapse, it'll overwhelmingly likely be where the first collapse, very near right. where the first collapse was right. centered, and the next one very near that. That looks to me it's going to give me something actually rather smooth and not chunky. Just the opposite. And so get chunky, I have to let it spread out, and then that that will be the case if these non normal CSL theories are built up for situations in which what you put here is a, is a set of mutual committing operators. 
Mm -hmm. Then you can, in fact, narrow and narrow and narrow and narrow. Mm -hmm. What we're thinking of putting here is something constructed out of, what we're thinking of putting here is something like thing you knew. Smear thing you knew. And the problem is that the thing you knew among themselves do not commute. Uh, okay. So it, you're never, ever. So one will mess up with one. One mess up with the other. Right? So generically, you don't approach Dagens. In, in that situation, you don't approach Dagens. OK, all right. So that's the piece that I didn't understand. OK. So, so I was trying to think if I can tell this story in a way that would say, well, and by the time you arrive to anything that looks like co a coherent universe that can be described in terms of something resembling a smooth metric and that, then you will need to be in the conditions where vile is very close to see. And what I wanted to perhaps try it in the sense, that's okay, very, this is... That's very interesting. Do you have this written out? Yeah. Is it on the archive? Yeah. Okay, thanks. This is published <laughs> also. Okay. It's, uh, it's called it's a not so novel explanation of the initial condition of the universe. <laughs> and the reason it's we call it not so novel is because citing the Bible, you know, at the beginning it was chaos. <laughs> <laughs> So this came up now because here was the idea was here's a, a place where the time indexing uh, comes out, right? Yep. Okay. But uh, I'm not sure how this exactly engages the, the whole discussion that we were having. No, so yeah, perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. Okay. I'm just trying to show you uh, the situation which I find it convenient to have the possibility of saying, well, and then the typical universe would start with five equals seven, then it would not be. Yeah, it's certainly one of the big questions is why did the universe start in such a low entropy? Well, this gives an answer to it. This gives an answer. Right, right. Right, so, and, and okay, so, but we were in the middle of trying to get clear about the relationship between I have just a few more things to say. Yeah, can, can I just make one more comment? Which is, it, it, it's just something that's, you know, a point that has not been mentioned. Uh, equal variance gives you, again, a kind of constraint, I would say, on a typicality measure in order to be coherent. So that, you know, it, yeah, it doesn't tell you which one to use, but maybe it rules some. And that has to do with the dynamics. But there are other things that make a measure reasonable. Of course, the one everybody who is used that has nothing to do with dynamics. So in classical mechanics, in phase space, there's a physical measure on space. Nothing to do with, my, you know, nothing to do with dynamics. There's just a physical measure on space. And that is the natural measure to use on phase space for the part of phase space where you put down the positions of things. And the measure on space also gives you a measure on velocities. If you have a measure on time, right? You have a measure on space, measure on time. These don't come from the dynamics as part of the space-time structure. Gives you a natural measure on, on, on momentum space. And that's why when you, when you talk about most of phase space in classical mechanics, everybody comes to the same judgments, right? I mean, nobody would say, oh, you're pile everything up. I'm going to use some weird thing where some tiny little order here counts as most of it. And that doesn't even have to do with dynamics. That has to do with the fact that you've got space-time measures in the theory. These are objective. These are empirical. And they play a role in defining the phase space. And it's natural to import them in your judgments about which regions of phase space are big and which regions of phase space are small. Now, I don't know if you want to call that logic. I mean, logic won't tell you not to do something screwy. But it will tell you that it's screwy, right? I mean, this is where the normativity comes in. Why would you depart from a from from a measure on phase space that arises in the most straightforward possible way from the measure on space and time that you're already using? Only if you have empirical reasons. What? Empirical reasons might what? get you to depart. But if if the one that works without even considering the empirics 
and without even considering the dynamics, works. Yeah, yeah. But the point is that to consider the possibility that one of the reasons that it works is that we are doing physics in a in an environment that is basically constant. The, the physics yes, being done at the time of Galileo yes, is being done the same that we are doing today. You know, we live in a part of the universe that is to a very large extent well defined by Minkowski space time and it was well defined by Minkowski space time, you know. Right. Granted we, we should always be misled by something that's locally essentially unvarying and we think it's absolutely constant. And right. it may be regimes where it's nowhere near, and we need to understand how those regimes fit together, uh, granting all that. Yeah. Right. So in the regimes that is... Right. But if you're doing classical mechanics and you think, you know, you're just doing it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't look like anything like that is a rising, it just looks like saying you've absolute space and time and stuff is always wrong. So yeah. I say, of course there's a, even apart from equivariance, there's a natural measure on phase space that arises from space time. Okay, now I'm going to work because you, you, you express this in terms of positions and velocities. Yeah. And so if I have two particles of different masses, I want to say, well, is a certain re, 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 region of phase space um, indicated by the same velocity interval for the two of them? Is that the same that Or the same mag momentum. Okay. Or, or, the, or the same momentum. And it matters because if you do it in terms of velocity, you don't have a, 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 um, a stationary measure. If you do a momentum, right. you do. Uh, uh, okay, fine. So, so you're so putting so dynamics back in, in canonical variables and stuff like that, which is also empirical, but through the dynamics and not through the empirical. Not through the yeah, so, I'm, so what I'm worried about the idea that there's a natural measure independent of the dynamics. That's well, it seems to be in tension with the idea that the natural measure needs to be. I guess I would say, off the top of my head, okay. velocity seems pretty motivated, momentum seems equally motivated. If they disagree, you might bring in further consideration to side the kingdom. But that doesn't mean there aren't a billion, billion, billion things that are completely unmotivated. <laughs> I mean, that's true. <laughs> that's good. So, one thing that is important for me in this a priori empirical uh, discussion is that we all agree we have dynamical laws and we have uh, this measure, be it a typicality measure or a probability measure. And then, if we come in a to a situation where we make empirical observations, to discover a new robust phenomenon that comes out as either very improbable or very atypical, what we do is not to tweak this measure but to reject the dynamical uh, laws because. Uh, what we, one thing that we learned from statistical mechanics and this rise of atomism, and David makes this case um, better than anyone else, more vividly than anyone else, is that the dynamical laws themselves put barely any constraints on what is empirically uh, possible. Right? David has these examples of you throw a stone and you could turn into a statuette of the British royal family and decide to get his work address and things like that. So the only means we even have to test dynamical laws is by discovering um, phenomena that come out as very improbable or I would say atypical. And uh, for this reason, this, I think this, these judgments of improbability or atypicality, they must be epistemically in some sense more robust than uh, our dynamical law hypotheses because we use them to test and evaluate the it looks like any time, any scheme in which there's uh, many, 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 many degrees of freedom for lots of right. dynamic relations, I think will have this, this consequence. Um, from the probability point of view, what it means is that the package of the best system will have in it, among its components a probability measure. But that it's the correct probability measure is itself determined by the Period. Yeah, but Dustin is saying that, that Dustin is saying something that I don't think disagrees with that. He's saying he's making a methodological observation right. about I'm the way I'm, we. I'm about, agreeing with it. I'm, right. just, I'm just trying to say how it looks. From right. I, that, that is, I know because, I, because Dustin was Dust, Dustin didn't say this. Maybe he didn't mean to go in this direction. But it sounded as though, look, in some way, the um, the, the measure. 
technicality, from the technicality point of view, has a kind of a status in which it's, you know, maybe not a priori, but more in right. the direction of being a priori than just, uh, you know, the fact that the sun is shining or something like that. And um, I see why he's saying that, and, and I, I think it's, it's right from the kinds of theories that we can imagine holding for our world, the kinds of packages of laws holding, that we, we, we're not going to give up um, the probability of the measure. Of the, uh, the We're not going to give it up very easily. Very easily, many, many right. degrees of freedom. Right. This is probably the right way to understand the famous um, quote of Eddington's. Okay. Um, uh, right. Yeah. Well, that's so all right. I wanted to do was to say something about, what the, about how, the, from the probability point of view, this looks. So it, it, it doesn't look as though the metaphysical status or the epistemic status right. of the probability measure is any different from any other law. Right. I mean, that's, but, 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 so I'm just actually amplifying what you said. It seems to me that the, the sort of historical observation that Dustin is making, the methodological observation that Dustin is making, is right. Um, but that doesn't, it, it, it's not clear how, uh, you know, what that says or, or whether that says anything about the stark metaphysical question that you wanted uh, an answer to. Or yeah, my understanding of this at this point is that from Tim's point of view, this metaphysical question is a wrong question. Right. Okay. Right. I don't clearly understand. This is not a, you know, I, I've learned for a long time now that getting an understanding is yeah. <laughs> it's not something to do. But I don't exactly understand why it's a wrong question. Right. Um, but I see that this is a, a move that one can make from this. Um, and it, you know, it do sound a lot like uh, fine. Right. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's an insult. <laughs> <laughs> it was meant to be. Mario was going to say something. Yeah. Um, um, um. It's just that I'm still possible which is to talk about that the typicality measures a priori or metaphysical after the discussion we had. Because as we saw, so when you um, justify the <coughs> probability distribution, you have your empirical reasons, and then you uh, just um, introduce it as, a, as, a, as an axiom in your, in, in your best system, and, uh, and that's it. And uh, there are different ways then to to justify certain axioms, so if we then uh, introduce the typicality measure as a certain axiom, um, there are different ways of, uh, of, of justifying. We have then the justification by means of explanation and uh, um, uh, some non-empirical uh, facts like uh, the equivariance, so that there are different ways to, to justify certain axioms. And they're not, I, I mean, it's not like we have some metaphysical a priori um, something coming uh, or, or just falling from the, the, the sky. There are different non-empirical um, reasons to justify certain uh, ingredients no, in these in, in these packages. I agree. Both sides have their non-empirical non input. So in the characterization of what makes for the best systematization, there's a non-empirical input too. Notion of simplicity. Good. Yeah. Good. Forms what information is important and so. So I, I agree with that, and that's um, But it, it seems that for you and for David, it's very important that something is empirically justified or that it's logically entailed. That, but if, if there's something in between, then you try to, uh, I mean, to no, find out the weaknesses. I, I don't or, think that's, I, I, you're, you're coming at it from the end of uh, arriving at a theory. Yeah. Whereas I think Barry's more interested in the question of coming at it from the other direction. What to make of the finished theory? What what status to assign to various components of the finished theory? Right. And and I think that um, um, I, 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 Barry can tell me whether this is right or not, but it seems to me that the view that, that what Barry is asking for when he's asking for a clean account of the metaphysical status of this or that is he has some particular answer to that question in mind. Look, um, 
um, the, the, you know, there are various components of, say, the classical theory of the world. Um, there is F equals MA, there is the Newtonian law of gravitation, so on and so forth. Those are logically independent of, of one another. You could have a different law of gravitation and F equals MA would still be true, so on and so forth. And the thought is that claims about the correct probability distribution or typicality measure over initial states in the finished theory has a status very much like those. Okay. I mean, there's a thought oh, experiment okay. which you admit makes a pretty stark difference between the two. One could imagine a world in which the dynamics of um, our world are still the best, part of the best system, but the probability distribution is very, <laughs> very uh, uh, different. Right. And that would give rise to you know, non, not, you know, very different world. Yeah, you know, non dynamic behavior. Right, 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 right. Behavior, right. So, so, so that's the. they're ruling the other. Is ruling that out as a or, or the other view has some, I, the, the way I would put it is the other view assigns some different kind of status to, um, to the typicality measure or the, or the probability measure that's, that's complicated and that I don't, and that I don't completely I, I, understand. I can see that because it's in a way also logically independent, but there's some a different kind of justification or to, to make the, the connections with the dynamics. Well, it's just if, so if, the, if the issue is, I, I don't know what you mean by justification. There are non, everybody in this debate agrees, like Barry was saying, that there are non-empirical criteria of theory choice, okay? Explanatory power, simplicity, elegance, I don't know what, okay? Um, um, there's nobody in the debate who's disputing that, okay? I think the question gets a little clearer if once the theory is on the table, okay? Once you've chosen a theory, okay? Um, um, you know, you look at the theory, parts of it are just sort of, I don't know, logic, okay? Um, Parts of it, you can say, are logically independent postulates about the way the world is, empirical claims about the way the world is. F equals MA, the Newtonian law of gravitation, okay? Then we've got these probability postulates, okay? I think Barry's saying, as far as I can see, their status is exactly the same, okay? They're of exactly the same kind. There may be different considerations that come in to to you know, different non-empirical considerations that come in to choosing one or another. But once the theory is on the table, it's clear that all these things have the same status, and they have different statuses than laws of logical deduction, if you were going to include those in your theory as well. Okay? That's the idea. And it feels like Tim has some more subtle and more complicated idea in which the status of that thing is a little different than the status of things like F equals MA and the law of gravitation. Um, um, and I think that's what the discussion has been about. Does that, does that sound right to you? Yeah, but, but, you know, but, but, I mean, just, just an, an example, which I guess I referred to earlier, you look at Maxwell's derivation uh, of, of, of the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And if you start with the idea, and I guess this is just a, a, an intuitive reaction I have, you read it and you say, man, he just explained something. Right. Okay, that was really satisfying. Right. I, no longer, mention, I no longer puzzled why when I check the velocity distribution in a box of gas, right. I get this. Right. Notwithstanding the fact that there are bad initial conditions where I wouldn't get it. But Tim, in my and, mind, and, this and is not, and, and let me and, and, say, yes. and, and independent of the fact that when that I have gotten it many many times, right, right, it's not merely that I'm noticing this is a regularity, right. and then getting a condition. But, but the, the, the status of the judgment that most initial conditions, or non-special initial conditions, or generic initial conditions. Not all of them, but in some sense, generic conditions will lead to this behavior. That that 
that constitutes a satisfying explanation. And if I didn't see that behavior, then either I would adjust the dynamics or I'd have to but focus Tim, on just that say, But let me just say one thing. This is, uh, this is just a way to make the difference in our intuitions of it. Yeah. It's similarly the case. It's similar in my mind. I take it it's not going to be similar in your mind. Somebody says, somebody says, you know, there's broken glass on the floor. Mm -hmm. And somebody says, I want to know why there's broken glass on the floor, OK? Mm -hmm. And somebody says it's because David dropped his glass, because the glass slipped, David let the glass slip out of his hands, OK? Yes. And assuming that, assuming that the testimony is not in doubt, OK, everybody's going to say, good. Now we have an explanation of why there's broken glass on the floor. Right. And if somebody comes along and says, look, it doesn't follow from David's releasing the glass that there's broken, you need the law of gravitation, um, um, you need F equals MA, so on and so forth. Everybody's rightly going to say, yes, but come, this is but, such, hold on a second, yeah. this is such clear background knowledge which everyone brings to the conversation that of course everyone's going to be satisfied that the explanation is done in every, hold on one second, that the explanation is done in every practical sense once we've tracked down that David let go of the glass, okay? But, um, but as a matter of fact, as it stands, if you take it seriously, of course it's a radically incomplete explanation. Okay, it's we're satisfied with it because we all know how to fill in the rest. Okay, but but if you're interested in the logical structure of what understanding constitutes, you do want to add the law of gravitation. Okay, right. and it's in exactly that same sense that it seems but to me. But what if the guy says? Yeah. Of course, we're taking for granted the law of gravitation. Right. Of course, we're taking for granted. Right. But David could have let it go and it hit the floor and the molecules in the floor be in precisely the right state to absorb the impact right. and bring the thing smoothly to a finish. That's why you need and another law. It. That's why you need another law. But that would be but really improbable. But that's, what, that's why you need another law to the effect that that would be really improbable. You see, I don't, well, you see, yeah, that's you where the need a law. I don't think you need a law. That's where, that's where the difference is. You think is. you need a law and I don't think you need a law. So part of why you think you don't need a law is the view you have about laws. Part of the reason we think, I think of today is that you come off with my role there. It's a view that we're holding about laws. Well, that's, I, that's I certainly want to say, say, and you guys want to say, there's no physical law that would prevent the floor from being in the state where it would cushion the blood. There's a physical law that would make it unlikely. Right. What would make it unlikely? Yeah. This is like. This is like what? Is it just the truth? <laughs> I, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> because there's a, there's a, the, the opposite is that, the, or the your view is that there's a something which would make it atypical. Yeah. Overwhelmingly, most of the, of the states in the world will have a break. And so I'm not surprised so, that it's so. I mean, here's a point, point, point of view from how this, about this discussion is from, my, from the way it seemed to me is that people would talk in probability with some understanding of what probability is. And then uh, some people, for me it was Shelley, said, well, no, I'm not going to talk probability. I'm going to talk typicality. It's a better way to, to talk. So to find out what's the, what's the reason for doing that? Why are we proving it? Why, why talk typicality? And it seemed to me that there were um, a, a few reasons given for that. This is the last slide I have. So. Is happy. <laughs> um, and and the, the reason that Shelley gave it first it, it, is that it doesn't make sense to talk about probability because his way of thinking about probability couldn't make sense of probabilities of the initial conditions of the universe. So I thought, well, he just didn't have the right way to think about probability. Now it might be that when I act, the truth is that when I told him how I think about probability, this is me in it now. Shelley said, oh, there's no difference between us. But he probably really didn't think about that very carefully because it turns out there is a big difference between the, the, the two views, the, the two positions. Um, but that's one of the issues. So that if, if the account of probability I'm giving is motivated, then it's, it's correct. Then the, the, that undercuts one of the motivations for replacing probability with typicality. The other motivation, which I'm interested in, what people think about, 
is that the account, at least in terms of the vernaculars, strikes some people as being way over the middle. Um, but I think of it as a, as a good feature of the account that it assigns probabilities to everything. Some people see as a <coughs> problem with the account. They don't believe that there are such physical probabilities. They definitely don't believe that we ought to be tracking them with our principal belief. Like I said, I think it's a good feature, not a bad one. There's another whole argument to, to engage right. in. I mean, for people who don't know, there is this irony that Shelley believed, I guess I believe too, in some part of that If I were a Humean, I would prefer physicality and probability. As a Humean, I would find that a more congenial notion. And Shelley says that all the time. That's why he says there's no difference between these things. If you thought it through as a Humean, you, you jump for so, physicality. So, so, so a Humean can certainly live with physicality because the typicality measure that would have the, the like all the uh, uh, other claims on the Humean view just be made. The, the question we've just been debating about, how is it related to the dynamic laws, we've got a clear kind of Humean answer. Um, to it. Um, but in fact, I think we're interested in probability claims because there are lots of probability things we decide probabilities to do. That the typicality claim won't. won't. The, the question is whether you have any need for probability that goes beyond typical frequency. And that was the thing you had on That's the slide. Right. At the end of the day, if I have a, a clean account of typicality, I can talk about typical frequencies, which you now need a collection. I mean, it, it leaves you dry with respect to single cases. That's right. That was the point. And the question is, right. do you really need probabilities that go beyond to Well, if as Bishop Butler <coughs> said, um, if probability is going to be tied to life, you do need it. Well, uh, you wouldn't. Well, you know, you have to, if, you the, if, if, like, you, if you think that what the empirical controls are empirical frequencies, then you're a little worried because single case probabilities come from in other controls. Okay, so that's another big deba debate. So like I, at least this has been, um, I guess, um, so I, I view that this is a really interesting problem because it engages so many things, even some things I hadn't thought about being engaged here. The, the, the idea that there's some uh, claims that are normative that are, yeah. is, has been uh, supported.